Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I am delighted to be joined by Colin Watt and Jim Simonetti. Welcome back to the studio, gentlemen. Thanks very much for having us, Paul. Absolutely. Great to see you. Uh, plenty to talk about, as always, on the Axon Bulletin. And we're running with the, the lead title of the transfer business. It doesn't feel as though we're finished, Colin. It doesn't feel as though we're finished. We've done... What I would suggest is a good bit of business so far. Mm -hmm. We've brought in three players from England's top league. Mm -hmm. Something we've not done that often, really, if you mm -hmm. think about it yep. over the years. I know that was a staple part of Martin O'Neill's transfer policy. Uh, we've brought in Ayeti, uh, El Yunusi and Duffy from the English Premier League. Big wages, mm -hmm. big fees, even the loan fees. Uh, but we've also brought in Turnbull and Barkas. And we're going to be asking today, where else do we strengthen? What's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it's interesting you, we kind of go with this. So, obviously, yesterday the point was being made, is this the best transfer window Celtics had? And I said yesterday, I don't think so. I don't think we're quite there yet. There's still a few positions I think we need to strengthen going forward that would make the team better as a whole. Um, but what is interesting to me, as we look at those signings that you just mentioned, Paul, is it's all signings that Celtic's been linked with before. You look at Turnbull, Turnbull's deal was on and then it was off again and it was on again. Um, and then we've went back and signed him this year. A Yeti, someone that Lennon has previously mentioned that he's been interested in and we tried to get him last season. Mm -hmm. Barkas was going to be the backup if we didn't get Fraser Foster last season. Um, Shane Duffy, there's been multiple times that we've been linked with Shane Duffy over the the, the numerous transfer windows um, and Elianusi was someone that we were linked with even back when he was at, at Basel so to me it looks as if that we are going to be trying to target players that we've either been linked with before or players that we've previously sounded out before so when we're looking at the positions we still need to fill I think it's it would be clever of us to look at players that we've been linked with in those positions before um, and see if that's who we end up going for. Well, you know, going back to what you said yes about yesterday's broadcast, <laughs> the point wasn't made, the question was asked, because mm. um, I was dealing with some tweets last night who ridiculed the suggestion that it was. The question was asked. And the reason the question was asked, when was the transfer window set up? You know, the uh, 2002, 2003? Somewhere that's when that. there was a transfer window. And if you were to actually look at some of them, there have been some very successful transfer windows uh, the, the best point, I think, from yesterday was you don't know until you look at what you've won at the end of the season. True. And saying that, my biggest kind of point and my observation is there's definitely a different approach to transfers. You compare what we've done in January to what we're doing just now. And then there's another um, kind of observation on that, Colin, in that the business we're doing, if we want to get through the Champions League groups, we shouldn't be risking it season on season. We should be doing that business in January mm -hmm. so that the team you've got is the team you're going to be playing. Definitely. But otherwise, you're bringing guys in a couple of weeks, sometimes days before one of the biggest fixtures of your season, the fixtures that are making you the most money potentially should you get through them, and you're throwing them into the first team, or indeed, you're putting them on the bench. So I think the bigger issue here is uh, doing the business is great, but should we not be doing that kind of business in January? TCB, long before it. Take care of business. Take care of business and everything else will come will come with it. If you get the players in as soon as you can, gel them in, help them bed in, then you become a better unit, Paul. There's no point in the lastminute.com. Remind, so remind us who was a, a big purveyor of the TCB philosophy. Oh, that goes away back many people. Uh, but uh, TCB, David Bowie had a, a sign for TCB and... Elvis uh, had TCB as well, didn't he? Did he have it on his martial arts outfits? TCB aye. taking care of business? Aye, uh, I think he did, aye. Yeah, so five in. I mean, and, and again, the big thing with that, for me, people might argue about Turnbull. I don't think Turnbull's a development player. I think he's a first-team player. Yeah, I definitely. think all five of them are first-team players. Yeah, definitely. So often what we find is we might bring in half a dozen guys, but three of them are you know, development players or ones for the future, Colin. Everybody we're buying is for that first team. And, that, and this goes back to a point that I was making, and I think, Jim, we've kind of had disagreements over this. When we're looking at Aaron Hickey, to me, he's a project player. He's not someone that's going to come in and give us 
25, 30 games a season straight off the bat. And the guys that we're signing at the minute, because of the importance of what this season is, shows that we're actually looking at the first team and saying, where is the gaps? And we're going in and we're filling them. And to be honest with you, it's for me, it's a surprise that we've actually went out and spent this amount of money. Because in seasons gone by, we knew where the gaps were, but we weren't filling them. This season, it looks as if whatever's happened it's, it's happened to me it, it reminds me of the, the still game episode where Tam gets shocked by the toaster I don't know if uh, Peter <laughs> Lowell's got a dodgy toaster but we're all reeking the benefits of Toasters. it hey we're happy with our but new reference we have a big man you put us on toast here <laughs> I know so what, where do you think they're still strengthening Colin just to recap I would say um, as I mentioned yesterday I think we need a left back definitely um, more of a sort of left wing back and a right midfielder um, right. and people will come in and say but Forrest does this and Forrest does that no I totally get that and I, I'm a big advocate for James Forrest anyone that's listened to the podcast that we've done I had him as part of our team of the decade but I still think he needs competition and competition is healthy we should really have three players that can play in each position as we go into this season ideally we'll come back to the left back position because that's been uh, another topic of this discussion but we'll also speak about some of the names who are being linked with Celtic Jim when you're looking at the squad um, as, a, as a whole uh, where do you think we still need to strengthen left back Anyone right else? back right back quite interesting what the, the young man said here I'm actually delighted that you're you're back on the show thank you very much because you're a fine decent uh, young man and you're a good you're a good guy as well and you keep up the good work alright because you're a smashing guy ok thank you very much anyway back to the question the thing is did you just say there that you need players in that could fill other positions no what did you say there then I was saying that we, we should ideally have a, three players that could play in a position for each place in the team so, for example, I would say that when you look at the, if we go to, say, a three-five-two, yeah, and you're looking at the right wing-back position, right. you're sitting there with the fact that you could play Jeremy Frimpong, you could play Hatem El, eh, El Hamid, but also James Forrest could play in that position. Right. And if you go to the left, at the minute, you've got Greg Taylor, you've got mm -hmm. He Who Shan't Be Named, and then it's sort of blank. Because ball, I ball and goalie, you're talking about. Yeah, ball and goalie. Name yeah. him. Don't, don't, don't be scared to name people, <laughs> a, a players. But he's a Celtic player. Name him. The, the I wouldn't play Mohamed El out there. Right. I wouldn't play Ryan Christie out there. And going on previous seasons, I wouldn't play Callum McGregor out there. Okay. So for me, that's where the gap in the team is. When you're looking at having that third player, it has to be someone that pushes Greg Taylor for a starting slot. Did you just say, sorry, Colin, to clarify, you wouldn't play El Unice out left, wide left? As an attacking player? As a 3 5 2. Because I don't think yeah. he's got the capability to come back and offer where, a defensive would you play option. Would you play? I would have him as behind the strikers. I'd have him through the middle. What are we calling that? Because I know that there's loads I of team around. I, 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 I need to. I'm calling mean, that position. Uh, right, right, what I back mean. in Championship Manager days, that was just your support man behind the striker. Your number 10, I guess yes. you would call it these days. Uh, right? as, I think so. See, I was getting confused the other day. I mean, I'm no uh, the, the best in the, in the world, but. Uh, I was getting watch him. anything, anything, <laughs> but uh, I mean the eight and the ten, mm -hmm. and I'm I'm sitting going, but Scott Brown's the number eight, so the numbers, all these numbers that the young ones are coming away and all this terminology, and what was that other one about the the, the number the nine? false nine, the false the nine, the false nine, <laughs> the false nine. These are all kind of new terms, Colin. You might have grown up. With, with these as you know common parlance but I remember I was uh, I was slagging off and criticising this terminology of the false nine and it was around about the time that the company was being formed to release the Nearly Mocking documentary and I'm, I'm, I'm venting off to look a good pal of mine from down south and I'm going on about the false nine and how it's all oh. of, you know this middle class snobbery and I says uh, so anyway what's the name of the new company false nine <laughs> Paul, when I was younger, long long before I was married, I remember going out to the dancing and whatever, and I got maybe myself a girlfriend that I thought was a, a nine or a ten, but and then it ended up being a two. You know what I mean? But anyway, that's days gone by. So these all, all these false numbers and sit that yesterday, he's a six, he's a six, he's a ten. And then you explained to me what that was. 
Now I understand a wee bit that a six year ten, that's what he's getting as a score. A number six should never be in a Celtic team. A number six. No, I agree with that. You know, if you're happy with someone oof. giving you a performance which is six, that's a mediocre performance mm. every week. You get players that, you know, they hit the, the kind of seven, a good performance every single week. That's great. That's consistent. Aye. And then you've got others such as El Yanusi at the moment, Colin, who's frustrating me. I think Rogic falls into this category sometimes in Cham, where you get a four or a nine. Four or a nine? You know, that's your performance. Mm. If you're giving them a score out of 10, the old school way it's saying that somebody played well was you just gave them a score out of 10. These days, you get screeds and screeds of stats from the from the guys who do all the stats yeah. telling you how many passes were completed and how many kilometres. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. But, Paul, no, but back don't... in the day, it was, you know, oh, I gave them a seven. Aye, mm. aye well, by the way, lots of people got a seven back in the day. But here, not to diverse away from what we're, we're, we're on about, me and John Cohen were talking and all these terminology, I mean, a flag kick. A flag kick. Is that what they call corners now? Corner kick. First or third. Is a throw in still a shy? Is it? I've heard a can throw we, in as a shy. Yeah. Can we still call it a shy? We're allowed yeah. to call it that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you young guys. No. So just educate us because we're getting a wee bit old for uh, these things. Listen, I'm not buying a, f- a flag kick. I'm not I having it. I'm not having it. Right. But we know what a. We know what a false nine is now. We know what it is. Aye. It's the name of that media company. I don't know if they're still going. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry, um, Yeah, so let's have a wee look at some of the comments coming in. Thanks, everybody, for joining us via our YouTube channel as well as Twitter and Facebook. You can comment via Periscope if you're on Twitter. And on Facebook, get yourself verified so we can see who we're talking to. Otherwise, it comes up anonymously. Um, so... First and foremost, we've got Stiggers1888. Looking forward to this one, boys. Let me kick things off with the Ryan Fraser rumour. I've written Ryan Fraser down because I brought him up with Colin earlier on. Now, am I right in saying he's a guy that could play outright? Uh, yeah. Outright? Outright. 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 You've already no, said... false thing. Well, you want, you want somebody wide right? Yes. Is he somebody who could fill that position? Oh, definitely. Um, and he's certainly a player that's developed a lot since he moved down to Bournemouth. Um When he made that move from Aberdeen, I don't think there was many at the time that would have said that he would have been a fixture within the Celtic team. Um, But, I mean, all you have to do is is take a look at what he's he's achieved down at Bournemouth. Mm -hmm. Um, He was linked with the likes of Tottenham and Arsenal and teams like that. But from... What we're reading, it sounds as if he's a bit homesick and would like to move closer to home. Is he a free um, agent? He is a free agent. He actually refused to play in Bournemouth's um, games once the league started back up. Um, scared of getting an injury that could affect a, a move. I think he was expecting to get more interest than what he has had so far. Um, if that opportunity came up and Celtic could afford the wages that he's been looking at, um, I certainly think he would be a great addition to the side. Right, so what age What age your boy is, is he? I think he's about 23, 24. Is he still as young as that? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Right, I'm sure somebody will be able to tell us that yeah, prior to me yeah. uh, checking. Uh, but Ryan Fraser, I think what you were saying before is always a, a good rule of thumb to have three players that could fill in in any position. Yes. But of course, if you're looking at uh, Ryan Fraser as being, or A and other, as being the guy that's coming into to fill the, the right-hand side. You've also got Forrest, you've also got Frimpong. On the left, you've got Forrest again, you've got Christie, you've got El Yanusi, mm-hmm. you've got Mickey Johnson yeah. coming back as well. And, you know, I think actually, for me, my first choice would normally be El Yanusi out there, Colin. Um, I know you're saying he's not as good with regards to his defensive mm-hmm. qualities. I also think Ryan Christie's quite effective out left. Um, and I think Alan Morrison backed that up with some stats as well. And I'm not getting too bogged down with the stats because I'm still of a mind that you give somebody a 7 or an 8 out of 10 rather than calculate how many passes they've made. And uh, the other guy, of course, uh, on the left-hand side that you know that we might come back uh, to discuss is in Cham. Could he play left? No. No? No. No, for, for me, you take that sort of powerhouse out of the middle of the park and it makes it weaker powerhouse I'd say he's you a think powerhouse so? if you think so yeah definitely by the way I like that grenade that's a fantastic grenade right because the remember, let's remember ah, you're yeah, not hugging the, t- the no, touchline for Celtic you're not you're not a left winger no. you're not hugging the touchline you're playing let's talk about your false nine or what, number ten or whatever you're playing to the left of that or to the right of that if you're playing there for Celtic mm-hmm. so let's say your, your, your guy behind the, the striker is is who Ryan Christie no, okay, yeah. on the right of him you've got Forrest and on the left so you're playing with three creative guys it just so happens one of them's more left one of them's more right I'm not saying he's left footed I'm not saying he's a left winger 
but I, I just think you've got to you've got to adapt your play if you want that creativity in there. I think looking at that with McGregor and Brown behind them, that's solid. But one of the biggest problems we've had this season is Scott Brown starting to show his age. Scott Brown's had a really poor start to the season. Do you think in so? Terms, in think terms so? of what we expect out of Scott Brown. I when think he was the linchpin against Dundee United. Absolutely. When we, when we go back to some of the performances... Can, can, I, can, I, can I come in yeah. a bit the Scott era, if you don't mind? Sorry there. Um, Scott Brown, with that goal with Dundee United, if you if you look back on the on the tapes, and he started the, the play from within his own half, he then picks the ball... I'm just going through it in my head here. He then picks the ball up uh, just into their half makes a play to the left, he then switches the ball across, makes his run in between the, the two centre-backs, stands there, hits the ball off, comes in, then makes his way into the box just outside the six-yard box, I'm sure, penalty spot area. Then there's a goal. Am I right? Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, he, no. he, I, I'm, I'm just he picked that, that ball head. up about 40 yards out. And um, there was a, a passage of play with Beach on. He moves in between, quite a simple move in between the two Dundee United men, gets the ball back, does a wee shimmy out to Frimpong, gets it back from Frimpong, and then plays it to Chris. And was he no part of the goal for the lead up for James Forrest there in the Motherwell? Where, where was he there in that part of the I think play? McGregor was the was main McGregor man. McGregor was getting but take it back, take it back. If you take it back and how it got to there. So we now call that the second assist, don't we? Well, the second assist. It's just a clearance from the corner or three was, kick, it? was it not? It's, a, it's an assist for an assist. assist. But, no, listen, the reason I'm bringing that up, Colin, is because sometimes the, the Scott Brown argument or the so Scott Brown point is that he's getting too old, he's losing his legs, etc. And I think we all agree that this season he can't play every game. Of course he can't no. at that age. McGregor's doing a lot of his running for him, isn't he? Well, that's the thing. With Brown and McGregor playing at the same position, mm -hmm. you're sitting with two guys deep. So if you're playing four at the back, you're really sitting six deep. And that gap between midfield and the forward line just isn't there. Now, I, I get what you're saying about Brown and how he had a good game against Dundee United. But there's been other games this season, at least two or three, where he's lost every single 50-50 he's went in for. He's got himself recklessly booked and he's been about a yard behind the play. There'll be people out there that'll agree and disagree with me, but yeah. I think... There's plenty who will agree with you, Colin. I think Scott right. Brown is at a stage where he is the ideal person now to come off the bench with 30 minutes to go when you're either one or two in a lot and you're looking to see the game out, or, as you said there, he does offer that engine room so that if the game is really pushing and you need someone to drive the team forward, like we did against Dundee United, he's the man... But can you do it for 90 minutes now? I don't know. I think he's another one that misses the crowd interaction. I think when he hears the crowd behind him, it G's him up a bit more. Um, but you take Brown out that side, McGregor plays a bit further forward, and Cham plays in that role alongside him. We don't need six at the back when we're playing teams like Hamilton. So where, where does, and I know this has been controversial so far, but we're talking about the midfield, where does Turnbull fit in? For me, Turnbull is someone that would play in front of the two that we're talking there. Mm -hmm. If you're going to have five, they're not going to be in a straight line. Two are going to be sort of box to box and one's going to be in when front you have of that. Linking two system. Up, yeah, yeah, linking up with the, the two strikers up there. Right. Turn, for me, and there'll be lots of people out there that will disagree with me, I think Ryan Christie's had a poor start to the season. I think Ryan Christie offers very little as a team player. I think he's a very individual type player. You can see it from the goals that he scored so far. Um, but one, he can't put a crossover. He takes every free kick and corner mm -hmm. and we're hitting the first man almost every time. And apart from running about the park, which we've all agreed is not something that you do as part of a team game. You don't just run about like a headless chicken. I feel as if he doesn't offer enough. I agree with you on Scott Brown. I, I agree with you that his legs and he's getting that wee bit older now. I agree with you on that. Um, don't necessarily agree with the, uh, the six at, at the back. Now, if you're going in, a, you're you're working in a three-five-two formation. Yeah, but what what was the point I was making about the six at the back is when you look at it at the moment, if Scott Brown's sitting here, 
Carl McGregor's right next to him. Yeah. And that, for me, is a waste of Carl McGregor's talents because he should be further up the park. When you look at the goal that we're talking about, um, James Forrest's goal against Motherwell, it's him driving forward that creates the goal. Yeah. And I think if he's sitting too far deep, we waste a lot of what is so great about so Callum McGregor. So what about uh, Callum McGregor sitting in uh, a centre mid and being further up the park in an attacking formation and still having that kind of a Scott Brown role, but he's higher up the park this time because mm-hmm. Scott Brown is deeper in the park. Well, see, when you look at the times when Scott Brown missed games last season and the season before through injury, Carl McGregor was put in that role, but it seemed to bring the best out of the midfield because Scott Brown can have a tendency to slow the game down. A bit like when you put beat on him, it slows the game down, brings it down to their level. Mm. But with Callum McGregor in there, the passes were getting spread out left, right. He was doing that full box-to-box role that um, both him and Brown are doing at the minute. Um, but I think we played some of our best football when Brown wasn't in the team. So, Cal- sorry, Paul, you go. There'll be there'll be points this season where we can see that. I know that uh, through our comments on this this bulletin, a lot of people have come on and, and said exactly that, Colin. And they would like to see a Celtic team, not because... Well, he is being phased out, but mm-hmm. that sounds a bit brutal uh, due to his age and what the midfield is going to look like without Scott Brown. And it may be a more creative midfield mm-hmm. and maybe a faster midfield. Yeah, definitely. You know, and um, I think that that will be interesting. The fact that we brought in Turnbull for that fee would suggest that we are going to see that at some point in the season. He's he's came off a few times. He said some good games, some bad games. His consistency may be different this season to, to other seasons. Turnbull's position, sorry, Turnbull's favoured position will be centre mid mm-hmm. oh yeah and I think um, I'm looking forward to seeing him actually uh, yeah. in a Celtic jersey some of the other names and we'll look at some of these comments because I'm going to throw somebody a name out there that's been mentioned so many times and I think <clears throat> I was speaking in glowing terms about Shane Duffy coming in over the last couple of days we spoke about the Irish connection is it important to Celtic of course it is of course yeah, it's important to the yeah. heritage of the club um, and also he gets it he gets the club He's, we're not plucking him from um, a club where let's let's look at a Yeti quality quality player he's not coming here because he's always wanted to play for Celtic mm-hmm. it's, I think it's important to have some players like that in the squad I know it's changing in modern football but a club like Celtic need a few guys in the, in the team like that Shane Duffy's given us it now Gaz sorry Jez apologies Jez um, you are commenting via Twitter and you've thrown in the name of James McLean. I've seen this mentioned a million times uh, on social media. Is that us just going too far down the line of getting somebody who you think would be, I was going to say something there, a mad Celtic fan coming in and to play for the club? Is he somebody who could actually bring something to this Celtic team? I would say so. Um, and I think he is, again, a player that divides opinion. Um, but he was, is it Stoke City? That, that mm. right, yeah. He won Stoke City's Player of the Year last season. Right. So, when you're looking at guys like that, then certainly they do offer something to uh, the team. Um, The thing about James McLean is, far too much is made of his off-field. Like, it's not even antics, because it's not him. There's no antics. It's just what he believes in. Yeah. And the way that he's treated down south... He's ostracised. It's despicable. It is. Um... But when he puts on that football jersey and he steps over the, the, the white line onto the park for 90 minutes, all he concentrates on is football. Mm-hmm. And he gives his all for every team that he plays for, whether he's playing for his club or whether he's playing for his country. And the fact that he is such a big Celtic fan, um, to me, if he was to make that move up here, then you can guarantee that instead of giving 100 and, 100% he would give 110% he would find that extra bit to give for the club and he does play on the left hand side so it is another option Where age is he? Oh, he's getting on a wee bit now isn't he? I think he's he's, 30, in, maybe. he's late 20s or 30 yeah Yeah. yeah. Um, it's not to be honest with you it's not someone who I would be in any hurry to bring to Celtic I love the fact that he stands up for what he believes in and, I, and you know I think it's deplorable that he's criticised to the level that he is I, but I don't see him bringing anything man's to the poli- club. Man's politics is, a, is his own politics. Uh, people believe what they want to believe in. That's up to the individual. Your opinion is your opinion. Colin's opinion is his opinion. My opinion is my opinion. So that's what life's all about, isn't it? 
It definitely is. Now, we've got uh, a new uh, viewer, Barry McNeil in Newry, Ireland. Welcome to the show. You're viewing us, you're watching this show on YouTube. I still think we can trim some excess baggage before we add to the squad. I think the point was made yesterday by Stevie that we do have still a bloated squad with a lot of guys who aren't going to be pushing for a first team jersey. We'll walk through all of these comments, but that point actually takes me on to some of the players that uh, we'll be talking about today. And one of them, Colin, you you raised the point that uh, Jeremy Frimpong recently, or I think it was yesterday, celebrated his first anniversary at Celtic. Um, I remember talking to a prominent scout who said to me that uh, he wasn't sure between uh, Frimpong or O'Connor who would break into the Celtic side, but at that point it was uh, level. Mm -hmm. He couldn't see either way which one it was going to be. It's interesting how both their careers have gone in completely different tangents, isn't it? It's really interesting as well because there's O'Connor away with Shane Duffy in the Irish squad mm -hmm. and he's never kicked a ball for Celtic. No. No. And he's so, a full international. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've just loaned him out, obviously, to Tran Mia. Uh, comes from good stock. I think, you know, going by social media, Man United fans were unhappy when he left the club. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you kind of thought, you know, he'd be the guy before Frimpong. Frimpong came in, he made a brilliant impression in, what would you say, his first five or six games. He was excellent. A couple aye. of bad injuries. Uh -huh. He was the out ball in the League Cup final. Mm -hmm. Only out ball we had that day. Mm -hmm. uh, sent off, unfortunately. But then I had a wee bit of concern regarding the fact that maybe through a different, a, a few different reasons, had they sussed him out? Were they putting two on him? Uh, was he playing, you know, with a wee bit more fear because he was fearless before? Mm -hmm. Or had the club kind of coached a different style of play? Because we didn't see the electrifying pace, the, the jinky nature of his play that uh, were a part of his early games. I think that started to return, though, isn't it? Well, definitely. And I think that is a confidence thing. When you come in and you sign for Celtic at first, he was aware that he was a de development player. He knew he wasn't going to be straight in there, straight in the first team. So the fact that he came into the first team so quick would have gave him so much confidence and we've seen that in his style of play. Um, I think it was the, the game at Pataudry last season um, when he was driving forward and he was causing, sorry, he was causing so much trouble for that Aberdeen back line. And then, as you say, a couple of injuries here and there later, sometimes it could have just been burnout for him as well. He's never played that many first team games. So you, you know what was good about him? He made you stand up, didn't he? He, he was on the ball. He he was on, yeah, when he was on the ball, you went, what's he going to do? Yeah. Every one is. Every one is, we're all, you know, even the cup final, everybody's going, he's get Frimpong Pong on the ball, get the ball out to him. Yeah. He's going to be able to take them on. He's going to be able to uh, get in that box with the ball. He's, everything was he, it was him, it was Frimpong. Pong. Give Frimpong Pong the ball, give him the ball. Yeah. And he's one of the, the kind of players that would just make you stand up and go, what's he going to do, isn't it, Paul? Great, exciting, very exciting. player. He's uh, I, think, I think he's going to be, uh, I think he, he'll have matured a bit more as well, but your point is, was that a, a stage in uh, the, the, the season where maybe a wee bit of that was taken out from him for the coaching staff or the tactical uh, part of the game? Maybe they did. But at me, I would like to see Frimpong... Okay, that's a hard shift in a three-five-two system. Back to what you're saying, mm -hmm. either Colin, it's a hard shift up and down that channel. But going forward, I would love to see Morium getting in, getting a, a completely penetrating uh, that last third of the park and getting the, those balls into the box, or equally him driving into the box mm -hmm. and then making the decision: is it a pass or is it a shot? But once he's inside that eighteen-yard box, that decision's done to him. And, and what I would say, final point on Frimpong, for me, he's not a right back. No. And that goes back to one of the points you made earlier. Five in, how many more do we need? I still think we need a right back. Well, see, the thing is, like, with Frimpong, what I really enjoy about how his play is, is he hits the byline. He is going into the box, and he's telling those defenders, I'm putting this crossover, or you're bringing me down. And when you get into that 18-yard box, if you throw a, a leg out there to try and bring him down there's a good chance you're going to concede a penalty. Mm -hmm. So when he's in that box, he knows he's going to get that ball across. And we've all often spoke about it on here, about the need to have a striker that is in and around the six-yard box or the penalty spot area to put the ball away. Now we look at a Yeti that's came in, it's two goals, one from the penalty spot, one from the six-yard box. That's the kind of striker that's going to feed off of a Jeremy Frimpong uh, 
clinic when he's going down that line when he's yeah. putting the ball across a Yeti needs to be there and he'll put it away look at the one that he missed with Klamala in the Mullow game exact same position mm-hmm. and we, we, we wasted it a Yeti would have scored that I was going to say you were well in there Colin that's a good point very good points that you've made there I was going to say from Paul is it an option to get back as a wide player in that system, he's got to go come back as a defender. Yeah. But as an out and out defender on the four, and f- four and four, uh, on a four four two, uh, he's only an option there. But he's no long term. And personally, I don't think he's a he's a, a right back. He's a, an attacking mm-hmm. he's an attacking midfield player. Now we're talking about your youngsters. My opinion. No, I agree with you, Jim. Um, I really do. Uh, we're talking about young players, so there's a, there's a few points coming in. Gary doing and welcome back, Gary. Uh, you're always welcome on the show. You're commenting via Facebook. I know loads of midfield players, but let's go for Ferguson with one eye on after this 10 season. Turnbull, Ferguson and Johnson, three best young Scottish players. Ferguson's name's been mentioned many, many if times you, on this if podcast. You look, you're right, Paul, and, and you're bang on. If you look at it, uh, it might have been... Um, uh, Stevie that mentioned Duffy, but it was definitely uh, he, myself and you that spoke about Ferguson. And I like I like Ferguson. I think he would be a f- fantastic player for Celtic mm-hmm. and linking up uh, with, uh, with Turnbull and McGregor and there's Johnson throwing into the, the heart there as well. That's, that's the makings of yeah, a fantastic midfield there and he's looking ahead beyond the 10 yeah. people are becoming completely immersed in going for the 10 and it's understandable yeah. but well, that's, uh, you're right, we're we, looking be- beyond that aye, but players we, like Ferguson aye, because we're not trying to know uh, uh, what we've said that the focus is on the 10 mm-hmm. but there's an opportunity there as well if we could get that player in I still think uh, that he would be a good backup player in there as well although Although the midfield players it's congested at the moment, but I don't think they'll all be there. I that, don't think they'll point, all be there. That point does come up yeah. a wee bit later on does from it? some of the, the comments, Jim. What I would also say about Ferguson, are you paying a similar fee to Aberdeen well, as what you've just that, played tomorrow? That's, that's what you need to pay. Mm-hmm. But for me, when you look at it, right, so we've got guys in the centre of the park like Scott Robertson, like Ewan Henderson, Ismail Asoro, Luke O'Connell. To me, I don't know if Lewis Ferguson's better than any of them. Right. Hold that thought, Colin, because that leads us on nicely to my next point here. We've been bringing up time and time again on this podcast, all the guys you've just mentioned there aren't playing football. They're they're just not playing, right? If you're part of the first team squad and you're not part of a development squad, even if you are part of the development squad, you're not playing many games. No. There's if no, you're one of the no guys development league this season. Well, if you're one of the guys you've just mentioned, you're not playing football. Now Conor McBride has just left for Blackburn Rovers, 18 years of age. Liam Morrison left last year, 17-year-old, to Bayern Munich. Uh, Barry Hepburn, 16 years of age, he's just left for Bayern Munich. Dembele looks to possibly be the next on that list. Is one of the reasons we're losing so many of the youth talents from Celtic Park, because there is, they had a ceiling at that age, there's nowhere for them to go. But you've also got the first teamers, Sorrow being one of them. Tommy Rodgick suffered from this, but you're not playing. Mm. For months and months and months, if you're not part of that first eleven plus the four or five subs who are getting called upon regularly, Colin, there's nowhere for you to go. It's no, no ideal, is it? No, and I think if we even take a look at the likes of the loan deals that we've put out there, I mean, you and Henderson went to Ross County last season. Mm. Barely kicked a ball. You look. You were just to give it some context. You. You were actually looking at all our loan players quite closely yep. throughout the entire season. Yep. And that was one of the biggest disappointments, wasn't it? Oh, between that and um, the likes of Jack, Jack Aitchison. Jack Aitchison will never kick a ball for Celtic again. But it's not to say that he's not got the ability to do so. It's just that we don't seem to bring it through. As you mentioned before, the last striker we really brought through, questionably, Sean Maloney. Mm. So when you've got someone like... Sorry. When you've got someone like Ewan Henderson, who is an undoubted talent, we've seen it in the performances that he's he's played for Celtic. We've seen it in Lennon's first game when he came on and played against uh, Hearts. There is a player there. There was a player in his brother Liam as well. I like Liam Henderson. I think Neil Lennon did as well. So we either play them or we lose them. Well, as that list 
um, shows we will we will lose them. This is this is a concern for me. You could be leaving. You could be losing players. We don't know how good McBride's going to be. We don't know how good Hepburn's going to be or Morrison's going to be or indeed Dembele. But I would much rather see them developing at Celtic than go away to the likes of Bayern Munich and potentially be a player that would cost you tens of millions of pounds to buy back. These players cannot get loan. These players will go up. They can get loan. We've got two interesting characters coming on tomorrow, uh, and Graham Diamond and Daniel Lennon. So great guests, great kind guests. So it'd be interesting uh, as the manager, he, he, Daniel Lennon. I'm quite sure he, somebody like him would go. I would take him. Mm -hmm. I would take him in loan, mm -hmm. or I would take him. Again, we're going to say it. We've got many friends in football. We've got many friends in football where these players couldn't go out. The majority of the players that you spoke about there, hey Colin, they might no even kick a ball for Celtic this season and get into next season. No. So they've got to get game time. Yeah. They've got to get the game time. And again, the Celtic will be putting on games behind closed doors to give them game time. But they've got to get competitive game times mm -hmm. for their own individual development within the game. Mm -hmm. It's important. And you look at the likes of the guys that we had out on loan last season. Of that, the only one to make it through into the first team was Stephen Welsh. And to be honest, being a, a Greenock native, he wasn't the most highly rated at Morton. They had him playing out of position at right back, they had him at centre half. And when he got called into the squad and his, his loan got cut short, they were quite surprised. So, these guys, I think we have to look at other teams in the league and build those relationships. I mean, the, the talk was meant to be that Scott Robertson and Ewan Henderson were going to go to Motherwell right. on loan mm -hmm. as part of the David Turnbull deal. Mm -hmm. That might still be the case, and it might get done further down the line. Right. But it should be that we have a team like Motherwell or a team like Don Hamilton, Fairman. St Mirren. Don Fairman had been mentioned yeah, before. Yeah, where I did say that, we yeah. can send yeah. four or five of these guys out on loan. What, what's, difficult, what's difficult about... Uh, putting these loan players in a uh, Premier League clubs is they'll have it written in the clause. Can he play against us? Can he play? Can he play here? Can he play there? So that then, if, if we look at the the other club in their way, uh, say it's Tim Fairman or whoever St Mirren in the league, whoever's in the, the Premier League with us, that means that that manager's got to then readapt and change his team round about. So they might not look favourably on that. I'm thinking more of the division, the divisions down to that, get, that's get a good question for Danny Lennon, term. isn't it? That's a good question for Danny Lennon yep. tomorrow. Yep. So uh, if you could take a note of that, Paul, that would be absolutely brilliant. Yep. So I think it's important they get game time. Mm -hmm. All right. If they go to a Premier League club, Celtic will definitely have it in the clause. Can he play against us? You wouldn't want one of your own players playing against you. But uh, I mean, I guess for some of those teams, if we're looking at bottom six teams, for example, that's maybe only two or three games out of the, the 38 game season. For 35 of those other games, they could be the best player in that team. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, selfishly, as a Celtic fan, if I can strengthen Hibs, Motherwell, Hamilton, St Mirren, so that when they come up against Rangers, there's a better chance of them getting a result against them, because let's be honest, the rest of the league isn't very strong. There's going to be very few and far between where you got a good point that way. Aye, you got a good point that way. So if I can strengthen a Hibs or a Motherwell by giving them Scott Robertson and Ewan Henderson and Jack Aitchison, and you, as you said, they can't play against us, fire away. So Lee Griffiths to Hibs in, right? Is that so what you're saying? when you're looking, when you're looking at some of these players, my concern is the teenage guys who are really showing promise won't stand about and not play any football, and no. that is being shown by moves to the likes of Blackburn, Bayern Munich, etc. But also on the flip side of that, Colin, there's a huge amount of guys who will be lost to the game because they're not developing. They're not developing between the ages of 18 and 21 if they're not playing, Jim. No. Then the contract runs out. They might get. They might be able to step down a few divisions. How many players are able to adapt to that? Not just talking about adapting to going up a level. How many players can adapt to going down two or three levels, Jim? Because that's difficult for a player as well. Yeah. Very difficult. And isn't it amazing? That Robertson, when he went down, he adapted 
So that's, again, that's an important message. That's a good question. But an important message is to these young guys who have been, who have been in the game, who have been in pro youth, possibly all their young playing life. Mm-hmm. They've, they've played at a professional club, but they haven't been involved in, in maybe with a grassroots players have been involved in playing for cups, playing for leagues. The, uh, the, the different things that these, youth teams have that pro youth teams don't have so they've been in that system and all of a sudden they're dropped out of it Mm -hmm. where do they go psychologically mentally mentally it affects them oh definitely it affects their confidence right I'm a Celtic player no you're no actually you don't play for anybody so so but Andy Robertson wow I'll go into Queen's Park I'll go to a club like Queen's Park. I mean, he's I'll a shining build myself up. He's a shining example. Mm-hmm. He's a shining example, but he's also an anomaly. Yeah, he's one in a million yeah. who would who would actually do that. You know, on the scrap heap, if you like. But it inspires Paul. Well it, is, it inspires others to see. I might not get to that level, mm-hmm. but I can get in to a, a lower league team and work my way up. And have it, and still have a good life in football, yeah. Yeah. and still be playing football to as long as I can. Because that's the important message to all these young guys, mm. you guys like you, Colin and other guys his age, play football as long as you can. Yeah. I'm 60 now. Ah, I, I wish and hope that I can still have a wee game of fives up right up until whenever 70, whatever. Well, Jim, you know, a Celtic State of Mind will be taking part in the Jimmy McGrory tournament we will at be. Carkin Park and they'll need to get the boots looked out for that one as well. It's a lot of, aye, aye, aye. But I mean, I know from speaking to you uh, that A, the Jimmy Johnson Academy have, have helped the development of players who have gone on to make senior and I think the, the number is well over 25 now. Mm. But one of the saddest, uh, most difficult things for you to take is a guy with talent who is no longer in the game. Oh, bro, my heart. And you see them when they're 23, 24, and they're not involved in football at all. And a lot of the guys, had they been involved in football, could have gone on to the coaching side of things, mm. so you're losing them from the game entirely. And that's sad. It's sad for me as well. But, I mean, the, the comments are coming through thick and fast. We'll work through some of these. This is a good point coming through from Toto on Twitter. Unfortunately, every year we sell a player. Hopefully it won't be Eddie, Ayer, or Encham can leave. Now, again, they're the three names that keep getting mentioned. I think you've got to throw in Christy into, that, mm-hmm. into the mix there as well. Uh, there, there may well be a departure, and some people later on, um, and I'll come down to Kevin Graham just now, actually. Kevin mentions how many come in depends on how many leave. Omar Colley's agent has confirmed contact, Ryan Fraser, rumour, and also Lewis Ferguson. But we still need a left back. We'll come back to the left back because, I mean, you know, it's a controversial subject. Um, Omar Colley, what's your thoughts on that, Colin? I mean, I think I agree with what Kevin and the, the, the rest of the guys are saying. I think it will be a one in, one out job if Omar Colley's going to make his way to, to Celtic Park, especially for the fee that Sampdoria discussing that's somewhere in the region of eight to ten million pounds and I really can't see us spending that much on a defender um, unless someone then does move on. To be honest when you go back to looking at what Neil Lennon had to say after the Fenwick Faros game saying that there's players that have been trying to make a move out of Celtic for a while Mm -hmm. um, if that is the case and they still feel after everything that's went on that they're not committed to this season, then I, I, I'd say just go. Um, because we've got an extended transfer window. Mm-hmm. We've got another month to go. Make the deals, get them done early, give us time to get a replacement in. Don't leave it until a week before and then we're scrambling to try and get players in. Now that we've got a potential option out there, we've identified them. If that player wants to go, then thanks for everything. See you later. Let's concentrate on guys that want to be there for the ten. I totally agree with that. Celtic Rab, who has been a big supporter of a Celtic state of mind, good to see you again, guys. Well, it's good to have you on board again. And also a special message from Ken Walsh. I love our gym. So there you go. There's some family coming in for you. I, there, Jim. I must be a family member. <laughs> there you go. Thanks. At least there's one. 
Yes, and uh, Nicholas Elliott totally agree. Paul, there's some agree with me as well. Oh wow. my goodness! Yeah. Constantly dragging deals out and gambling with qualification has cost us. I know there are legalities, but it highlights the money handed to the EPL that can make make a bid and sign. It goes back to there's an earlier point there that the players act, that were just signed wouldn't have been available in January, and I take that on board. I think you know we we could have made a move for a Yeti, for example. Uh, January is a terrible transfer window for mm-hmm. Celtic. I can't actually remember the last player that came in and made a proper impact. Below flood. <laughs> so what are you talking, like 10 years ago? 2009. 11 years ago? Mm-hmm. And by the way, I was tongue-in-cheek because they never made an impact. But You you look at the players you mentioned on Twitter mm-hmm. about a week or so ago. Yes. Guys that were shipping out, Bio, Klamala, guys like that. Could All January Andrew. transfer signings. Mm-hmm. We keep going on about how January is the window to come in, bring players in, bed them in, have them ready for the qualifiers. But the guys that we bring in, they're just... Who's that, Dooney? I don't know. I don't know if we have a different scout for January windows and what we do summer windows, but... I think it's don't all about coming together. The, clubs the not being prepared to sell players in that month because it can make or break their season as well. Well, see if that's the case. So and you end up paying bigger money for the players that, you know, if you get them maybe now, it would be a lesser transfer fee. Well, when it, in the transfer market, circ- circumstances dictate the move, doesn't it? So you're looking at it. Celtic will be working tirelessly eh, to get players in in that market. And it's not really happened the way we're looking for it to happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So your strategy is going to be looked at and how you bring them in and look at them maybe a wee bit earlier, tie the deal up before the January comes along. Yeah. You're throwing them in just before these big games. And I say big games, I'm talking, we know the bread and butter is the league, we know that. But big in terms of finance, big in terms of the, the balance sheet, because there's the business side of it, we can't ignore that. We we'll keep talking about the Champions League bounty, but it does seem like a gamble, and I think it, it is difficult, and it's more difficult to get them in in January. That you know that yeah. much has got to be yeah. kind of um, you know you, you've got to accept that. But I think if that's the case, we should just write the window off. I wouldn't go out and start start spending money that then becomes a waste. You know what I thought was a good January transfer window, and a lot of the players ended up not playing, but. It, it gave competition was the one just before Rod- Rogers left don't laugh you could name it Ollie Burt right? Tim, Timo Weah guys like that oh, yeah. but the, what happened there was it gave the competition that was required so who was the guy that like uh, that set, um, set up Edward for the winner in the Scottish Cup final well it was Lustig and Toyan sitting on the bench mm-hmm. so yeah. it actually upped his game it upped his game he became your first choice right back yeah, again. I mean, but would, you, would you still care the big uh, Lustig about the park yes uh, well, there you go. There, there's two different opinions. I think it was time for Lustig to go. The, as a player. The, the big argument as a player. that I totally get is that he, co- he was good cover for right back and for centre half. Mm-hmm. And but we I, just I talked him about the park, didn't he? No. It, we wouldn't have. I, I think the big, the big problem there for me, Jim, because I, th- I, I looked upon Lustig as being a captain. Yeah. You know, one of the guys who's maybe not got the captain's armband, but you'd look up to him in the dressing room. I just think that it came down to finance with Lustig. He wanted more than a one-year deal, I believe. Two years, yeah. He wanted a two-year deal. And I, there's no way you could have given him a two-year yeah. deal. We'd still have him just now. Mm. Well, th- that's the thing. I wouldn't mind having Lustig this season, going into 10 in a row, because we spoke about it's it back before. in Sweden, isn't it? Yeah, AIK. Um, we talk about having guys like Paul Lambert, Tom Boyd, that were in the squad, mm. but never necessarily played every week, but they had that, um, that character about them. And we just mentioned Shane Duffy coming in, Big Celtic fan, knows exactly what this season means and will not be shy to let everybody else know in that dressing room how much it means to him and how much it means to the fans. Lustig was one of those players that are very few and far between that come from not having a background in Scottish football or being a Celtic fan that actually get what it means to be a Celt. You look at guys that have come in like... um, Massimo Donati or mm-hmm. Mark Rosas mm-hmm. that still if you see them on Twitter now they always speak about Celtic Mikel Lustig was one of those guys that actually got what it meant to be a Celtic player but what was he most importantly as well he was a winner yeah he was exactly. a winner yeah. he he's eight eight league me- eight, yeah. eight league eight, medals yeah. eight league medals he's a winner he knows what it means to win he knows the mentality that it takes to be a champion yep yeah. He knows what it means when they're running, what it, what you've got to get extra. That I think he'd have gave run about the club as well. 
you're talking about Shane Duffy. I actually said yesterday, Paul, that he had 220 odd games in English, yet, and I think he jumped in and said the Premiership. That was a mistake. It's actually an English game, Championship, right. Premiership, and whatever. Mm-hmm. Shane Duffy will come in and bring the experience that he's got out of those hundreds of games that he's played. He will have. Now, yet the difference is Shane Duffy will come in and take that role. But has he ever experienced being in a winning, a winning team like he's going to experience when he comes in? So it will actually help his game. The other players run about him. To what people can say, uh, what he knows what it means to be a Celtic supporter. We already, mm. but but when you're on that field, you've got to know what it means to want to be a winner as well. And we, we spoke about Jeremy Frimpong earlier. I think. Lustig would have been ideal for Frimpong's development because, as you said, he's a winner. He's got the experienced head. And I think if he was a mentor to someone like Jeremy Frimpong, I'm not saying Lustig could make the same runs that Frimpong could make. He's not yeah. as quick as Frimpong. But just having that experience, I think he's got like 60 or 70 caps for Sweden. Oh, yeah. He was an invincible very, twice, wasn't yeah. he? Mm. So just having that experience would help the player's development. It would. Up. But the problem with, with that is the wages. Yeah. The wages for someone who's not playing every week. I think that's a stumbling block. Mm. Has Frimpong not mentioned uh, that Paul Diamond Green's a, a good help for him? Probably. I think he has, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Paul, isn't it great? We've got the, the young guys on the show uh, who bring their, their love for Celtic and their knowledge on the stats and their knowledge on the different players. It's fantastic. We, we hopefully bring... That uh, uh, for the for the olden days, for the games in the sixties, the seventies. Speak then, for yourself, Jim. I <laughs> then you're going to bring in games for the eighties and the nineties and so on, and uh, I think I think it's good to have that wee mixture. But wouldn't it be nice if there's people out there who would like to come on the show and contribute some of their some of their thoughts as well? I think it's great, a complete mixture. What about some ladies? What about some of the girls out there? Would the girls want to come on? I, I think it would be great. I, I think you're absolutely right. And as of today, uh, we've set a, a scheduled time at 12.30 for the built-in, Monday to Friday. And every single day, you, we will have a different guest. So, Colin, you will be coming in on a Wednesday, I think. Wednesday. Uh, Monday, Tuesday. We do currently have uh, Laura coming in on, on a Friday. But yes. Uh, so Laura will be more than welcome to come in she's a great speaker about football she's a big Celtic fan she's a great writer so Laura will be a a welcome addition to the team and we'll just see some new faces and hear some new voices as well so more than welcome to get in touch if you're watching this and you want to come and get get involved Yeah. so we do have some more very interesting comments coming in John Francis McKeown YouTube I'm going to throw this to you two guys maybe someone out there knows the answer to this question Apparently, it's the same agent young Dumbelli has who represented these three other kids to go to Munich and Blackburn. Maybe Kevin Graham knows that? I don't so know. So that's the boy that used to be at Celtic then. Um, he was a, a scout for Celtic. It's no Moss. It's no Moss, is it? Okay. Uh, it's David Moss. David Moss. Is, David Moss. Moss. David is that the same, is it the same guy? That's All the right. same guy. That, and he was also part of... He's Aaron Hickey's agent at the moment as well. Mm. He's All the right. one that took him out to, to buy him. So... So it's David Moss. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, a Stramash or a Stramash um, who is commenting via Periscope. Good idea to loan out players. Need to get these guys playing, have a pathway to the first team. 100%. I keep banging on about the Reserve League. I remember the Reserve League, but I studied and researched it as well, going back right to the, the 1960s. And I don't know if the, you know a, a newly devised Reserve League is the way forward. I don't know if we're too far behind now because it doesn't exist and the cost implications would be too much to the clubs. But Colin, that was a bridge. That was a bridge to the first team. I mean, you listen to stories, not just Celtic stories. You listen to um, guys that played for Rangers or for Hearts or for Hibs back then. Um, and you talk about when Celtic played Rangers at Celtic Park, the reserves played at Ibrox. Rangers mm-hmm. played Celtic at Ibrox on mm-hmm. the same day. Um, and it wasn't just first team players that were in there. There was like there was guys coming through, um, and you listen to, well, if you have the misfortune to listen to guys like Derek Johnson, they say coming through at sixteen and playing with guys that were twenty, thirty coming back from injury made them the player that they became. Mm-hmm. So when we're doing that now, 
if you look at our, who our reserve team would be, you're talking about guys that aren't getting into their first team. Guys like Soro, guys like um, Henderson. They're the, the biggest worry at the moment. You, you buy in Soro and he just doesn't play. Yeah. Klamala would probably be your reserve striker. Yeah, I'm sure he would. So, I'm sure he would. But then they're not coming up. Even like against... Griffiths, Colin. Yeah. Get them games, get the confidence built up. But they're not coming up against guys of a similar ilk. I know. So, see that jump between reserve football and first team football? It is even bigger than it ever was. Ross County won the reserve league with guys at 15 and 16. But that's because we've gone so far without a league now. It's going to be hard to then re implement it into the game. Well, I think that was a year or two years ago. Ross County brought. They, they, they had the best reserve team in the league and it was guys at 15 and 16. They're taking guys out of school, taking them down to Greenock to play Celtic and they're coming up against guys like Griffiths, um, guys like Bio at the time. See the thing as well, because you, you knew, obviously, playing a lot of the games at Capital yeah. as well, but if, if the reserve league, if this romantic notion that I've got that we should have a reserve league um, can't come to fruition and it probably can't due to the financial element of many of the other clubs, Colin. Then the other thing for me, and, and I thought it was actually a really good proposal, was to to introduce younger teams, as they were called, cult teams, uh -huh. into the lower divisions. Now, again, go back to Jock Steen, the guy who was a forward-thinking manager. He spoke about this in 1968, to the point where there was actually an application made and it was knocked back. And one of the, the guys who was against it was Partick Thistle's chairman at the time because he felt that wherever Celtic were playing their second game, it would take fans away from Partick Thistle to watch another Celtic team playing in green and white hoops. It didn't happen, but you think about the fact that it happens in Spain, yeah. right? So you've got B teams playing within the pyramid, within the structure. It doesn't do them any harm, does it? No, and I think when you look at it, the Colt teams have now been part of the, I'm not sure what it's called now, I think it's still the Caramel Wafer, Turnox, Iron Brew, Whatever cup That's it's called. That's the Challenge now. Cup, yeah. yeah Tommy that one the petrol tank cup. Aye, the, the cup. fish and chips cup, whatever it's called now. Tommy Tunnocks. Um, Rangers Colts actually made the semi final last year. Mm -hmm. And they came up against some big teams like Wrexham and um, some other proper first. I mean, it's a one off 90 minute game, right? So, as we know, in 90 minute games, absolutely anything can happen. But. When we look at the, the kind of teams that we're loaning these youngsters out to at the minute, you, you mentioned McBride earlier that signed for Blackburn. Mm -hmm. He was in League Two last season. He was in the Scottish League Two. Yep. So And it, it didn't shine by all accounts. No, he no. scored one goal. Mm -hmm. But he, he, the biggest issue I've got with the the Challenge Cup, I think is the, the real name for that, isn't the it? Depen name. Yeah, depending on the, the sponsor. Uh, but the Challenge Cup, I think when they started introducing cross-border teams, that became an issue because of the cost implications of playing a game elsewhere. Oh, well, it was for some of these smaller clubs. They actually managed to bring some sort of sponsorship to it. Yeah, and teams were getting paid to travel to Northern Ireland, to Wales, to the south of England. I think teams. Who like was the team that was there was a late cancellation though, and it hit them hard financially? I think it was Coleraine. Mm. They were coming over. Coleraine. Uh, Coleraine. Sorry, um, I think it was East Fife were going over there. Was it East Fife? Um, but there you go, right? What's the point? I know. What's the point? If it's going to cost, you know, the smaller clubs. Yeah, what, what, I know. What, what is the point? What is the point? But you've got to remember for C teams. No, no, you don't need to remember. There's, <laughs> no, there's no point in these five going out to Coleraine or Coleraine coming over here. The cost implications, the travel arrangements, everything like that. We could have a reserve league here where everybody is playing. Everybody's got an opportunity to play. Competitions. And going to places like Ireland or Wales or England is fantastic further down the line. Let's get these young guys and these other pros all playing on a weekly basis and with, our, with the first team and with a reserve team. It's got to, somehow it's got to come back. And again, that's how tomorrow I'm really looking forward to speaking to Graham Diamond, who was an ex, a, or he might still be a, an SFA a assessment officer for your for different badges and involved in football for a long time and Danny Lennon I'm really interested to see what these guys think because I'm sure they would be delighted with some of these players every team Alamar Athletic East, even these five mm -hmm. whoever it may be get the game stronger with, with, with guys playing See, see what you're mentioning there it will be a very interesting point to put to Graham and Danny Lennon because they're, they're obviously 
with a provincial club, and that's yep. not disrespectful, right? They're with a no, club who've got a very tight budget. They've probably got five or six players signed up because they're working on yearly deals mainly, aren't mm-hmm. they? Aye. And it's difficult for them to get... And they've got almost a different first team every year yep. with, with maybe the, the core of maybe five or six players. I think the cost implication will prevent us from ever seeing a reserve league in Scotland again. But if you take, let's say, five clubs who would... I mean, if you were to look at the squads right now, Colin, of every club in the in the top division, how many of those clubs could field a reserve team? Not all of them. No, Not no, all of them, right? No. But Celtic could, Rangers could, Aberdeen, Hibs, Dundee United potentially, maybe Hearts in the, the Championship. Is there any way, and I've just criticised the cross-border implications of the Challenge Cup, but is there any way that that could work in terms of a development structure or a reserve league with clubs in England? Well, I mean, I brought the point up earlier about us trying to link up with teams and loan players out. Now, we're going through probably one of the most unprecedented times in Scottish football yeah. with the COVID situation. I agree with you. Um, yeah. I know that certainly um, from experience, I've got family members that are involved in football and because of what's happened with COVID, youth development is just not a thing anymore. A lot of pl- teams that had spent money developing the youth players now can't afford it because they don't know when the money's going to come through the turnstiles from fans returning, what they're going to get from TV deals, from sponsorship deals. So it would be prudent, I think, for Celtic to reach out to these lower league teams and build a partnership with them where we can get these guys out there at a younger age playing some first-team football. Um, And I think the benefits works both ways. You're talking about Clyde maybe only having five or six players. Mm -hmm. If we were to give them three or four players on loan... Mm -hmm. Maximum's four you can get. Is, right, it, is so that right? Th- there you go. Th- them for guys one club. Are, sorry, for one club. club. Yeah. Maximum's four from one club. Remember, yeah. the Newcastle boys went to Ibrox. Was there five of them? Four or five be, of them, right? Uh, it might be different over cross borders, I'm not sure. But. but for example there, last season, when we spoke to Paul Lawson, the manager mm-hmm. um, of Fort Martin United, mm-hmm. we were speaking about the fact that um, Fort William, as a team, got 12 players on loan. From Inverness, Cali, Fissel. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that the Highland League's a fantastic standard of football, but it's men's it's better than under eighteen football. Yeah. yeah. Ah. Aye. So, so they get tw- they get twelve. Twelve players. Well, to my knowledge, it's quite controversial, it wasn't it? Lower, but they're playing under the professional level. Yeah. So the Highland League, they they sent all the boys out there, and they started winning games for mm. the first time in three years. But then again, you've got now. You've got the incentive by the lower league, the, the lower leagues now to come up as well. A lot of junior teams have joined that. Mm. The south, the east, the, the west. There's there's an opportunity to get players in there as well. Good good shout. If you again going back to the back in the day scenario where they did farm players out, ah. Canada Leash famously went to Cumbernauld, and you know players went to Mary Hill and all these yeah. different clubs. But we obviously have been doing a bit of work with Haddington Athletic, for example, Jim. So you're you're going down to tier six or uh, you know tier know. five, and these teams, I think it's good experience for younger players to go and get farmed out to to that level. I mean that Haddington pitch is unbelievable, isn't it? Beautiful. The manager's Joe beautiful. Hamill, who played with, with Hearts, lovely fella, Joe, and he played with Leicester as well and Livingston. And he was saying because the question I gave to him was, "Would you rather play at Rugby Park or there?" And he would rather play at Haddington. The pitch was lush, mm. beautiful. As soon as you see it, you know yep. you, you walk to when you go and you're involved uh, uh, in football and. Um, even at youth where, where I'm involved in and you go and see a beautiful park you go wow nothing like still playing on the grass eh? yeah. still excites me like, wow look at that park it's great did, did you used to look at the black ash the same way Jim? aye absolutely <laughs> big knees and everything. aye aye, see, aye I mean, you're right in what you're saying you look at the teams like Darvel who are now in the, the new west of Scotland premiership they've got guys moving down from league one league two even the championship mm-hmm. to play for them um, we're minutes away here in this studio from Bonnie Rig Rose's stadium. Um, I actually drove by it earlier. It's a stunning park. Mm-hmm. They've made it into the later rounds of the Scottish Cup. You're right. If there's players in the under 18s, for example, that want to go and experience what it's like to play senior football, teams like that should not be no, you know, dismissed. You're no. right. Not a million no, years ago, you know, Don Fairman had a tie in with Logelli Albert. 
and they used to, you know, two maybe two or three young guys, Jim, 18, 19, would be playing for whole seasons at a time with yeah. Rogelli Albert. I know that Oakley United used to get a couple of players from Dunfermline. So they had local junior clubs that they would put the players out to at that age and they were getting... I mean, they're up against... It's a, it's a competitive level. Let's not Aye. underestimate the level. But you're up against the ex-pros a lot of the time yeah. as well, you know? That's who, right. And maybe at the wrong side of 30, let's say. You heard Jim Leishman. Mm -hmm. You heard Jim Leishman the other day. Oh, no. I'm up against Jinky. Oh, uh, he's just making a comeback. And all through the game, Jimmy was talking to him. Don't worry about me, son. Just play your own game. I mean, that's quite a hard thing to do. Jinky says that to you, obviously, <laughs> right enough. Don't just worry about the game. He says, then I was on my backside. Mm. What are you then doing there? Come on, son. See, the next time I'm going to come here inside and I'm going to go to your outside. These pros, these pros that's been through the game as well, actually... They do when they're on part, but even op opposition, they help young players that they're playing against as well. It's an education. It's a complete education. So I think it's um, it's important that we get, and we keep banging this drum, don't we, Paul? Mm -hmm. We've got to get the young players playing. They need to get them We've integrated. Get them playing. You're right. The, the experience, not that I have, but from a couple of friends of mine who played with Celtic was um, John Potter and the late... Graham Morrison mm -hmm. uh, they, they're playing alongside people like Mark Viduka mm -hmm. for the reserves yeah you know they're playing alongside Andy at home for Celtic reserves yeah they're, play, they're playing at Ibrox yeah. for the reserve team against let's say John Brown who might have been playing for Rangers um, I mean that was one of the biggest fixtures in the Scottish football calendar oh, Rangers v Celtic reserves eh? 12,000 yeah. you know I mean yes I know that other teams, the reason why it doesn't exist was because other teams were struggling to pay the cost that, that was associated with reserve team football. We've got to sort something. We need to sort something. But if I go back, I, I went to the Scottish Youth Cup final in 2012 or 2013. Celtic played Queen's Park and won 8 1. Callum McGregor scored four goals that day. Well, yeah, that's well, right. Well, just, right. off, just off a striker. Mm -hmm. Next season, he's out on loan. He's away in Notts County. Yeah. So, but did, has he improved? Well, did, I, when he came yeah, back, had he improved as a player? The, there you go, that, man. That's the, that's the thing. You're, that Liam moved turned around his career. Yeah. Oh, obviously. You know? Liam I'm, Henderson absolutely. goes out to, to Norway and comes back a better player as well. We we do have... I think players maybe need to come out of their comfort zone a wee bit and just say, it's not enough for me just to be in and about the squad. I need to be playing. I need to be playing regularly. And you never know. You could be playing for a team and you never know who's watching you. In the next minute, you're making a big move. You never know who's watching. Exactly. No, you're you right. just never know who's watching. Well, Gary Doonan is playing. watching this show and he has uh, confirmed that it's not the same agent in relation to all the kids we spoke about. Not the same agent. Uh, so that's an interesting one. Stevie Mullen was with us yesterday and he is commenting that we need to put an extension on the changing room. We don't want to let anybody go and resign the ones that have left but want to bring more and more players in. You know, the, the thing with that, you know, to, to a degree, I know we've got a bloated squad. I know yep. that. Um, Colin, you commented that we can use the loan market still yep. to bring a few more bodies in. I wouldn't like to see Ayer leave, Christy leave, Eduard or Encham. I want to keep all of, the, all of those type types of players I think can give us something. We're going for five competitions this season. We're still in Europe. Two Scottish Cups, a League Cup and a League. Five competitions. If the book's you balanced, need squad. If the book's balance, Paul, uh, uh, and it's... I would keep them. I would. I would keep them as well. I. I would say, if Neil Lennon's looking at these players on the pitch, and on the training field, and sees that these players want to be here and want to play for Celtic, then if we can keep them, then keep them. But as I said before, if there's players that are just moping around and don't want to be at the club, get them away. I. We don't need them because we. We that can cause problems within the changing room. And yeah. you just want players that will turn up and give your all, no matter who they're playing for. You, you want to begin and go, Gaffer, I, I know I'm not playing, I know I'm not playing just now, but I want to keep working at it. I want to be at the club. I want to be part, I want to be part of the team. I want to be part, I'm going to keep working, I'm going to work at it. Yeah. But then you get these guys that so know the big money, they've got eagles, ah, I'm not happy with this, I'm not happy with that. I'm with you, Colin, I don't want to be there. Yeah. See you later. I'd rather have players that are disappointed. But I'd like to keep them. Aye, aye. But I'd like to keep the players if they want to e e be here still. I'd like to keep Big Ayer. Definitely like to keep Ayer. Mm -hmm. I would like to 
uh, uh, keep. I know you on early in the show there. You said Christy might be the one of the ones going to. I'd like to. I'd like him to he, he still be here as well. I'd like them to be here. I think that with Christy, he could be one of the ones that, say for example, he was dropped for three or four games. Mm-hmm. I think he has that mental ability within him to say, I'm going to prove you guys wrong. Excellent. But when you're a first choice and you know that there's no one there to replace you, it can be very easy to become competent in your position and you can put out those, as we were talking about earlier, six and sevens out of tens because you know there's nobody there that's going to replace me. Whereas I feel if he's been pressured, just like he did when he went to Aberdeen and he came back, he can get that form back again and prove that he deserves to wear the Celtic jersey. Yeah, but you can never become complacent within yourself that there's nobody there going to come and chap on the door. You must you must keep thinking, how do I improve my game? How do I improve my, o- my overall mentality towards my training, towards everything as a footballer? You can't have any room for complacency to stay at the top. Doesn't matter who, who you're looking over your shoulder at. It's focus on yourself. I'm in here. I deserve to be in here yep. because I work hard. No, because that guy there's somebody they're going to be pushing me. I'm here because I deserve to be here. You're right. That's exactly why you're there, Jim. And you've got a fan base that's coming through with comments saying that they love <laughs> your appearances on this show. Right. Uh, what I would say is YouTube. Get subscribed on YouTube. We're building up our subscribers. You can get notified of the new shows. But we will be here 12.30 every single weekday. We'll have new guests every day. Colin's going to be your your uh, on your panel Wednesday on a Wednesday. Wednesday. <laughs> on a Wednesday. Wednesday wonder. Your Wednesday. The Wednesday wonder, right. But just uh, one final question before you go. you go. It comes in from Eduard Sean via... Twitter stroke periscope, do you think we'll get the 10? Yes. Yes. How confident yes. are you? Confident. Confident. I'll, I'll be 110% until the next game kicks off and then we'll start getting nervous again. <laughs> right. We're, we're focusing on the 10, Colin. We're focusing on the 10. I said earlier, we're playing for five tournaments this season due to the Scottish Cup dropping into this, this season. How many can we win out of five? Out of five, I would expect... Three. I would expect three. I'd be delighted with four. I think you can rule out five. No limitation is limitation. There's no limits to what Celtic can achieve this season. There's no limitation at all. We can be whatever we want to be in the right in the right frame of mind and the right togetherness and the right team attitude. Led by our leader Neil, Neil Lennon. Neil Lennon is a fantastic, fantastic coach. He's a fantastic leader. I would follow him. I would run through that wall for him. Absolutely no problem. He's the kind of coach I would love. I would do whatever Neil needed me to do on that field. What Neil wanted me to go to the Greenock Celtic Supporters Club, I'd be there. If Neil wanted me to go to the San Francisco Celtic Supporters Club as a player, I'd be there. I'd be there. Ten in a row? Definitely. No qualms about it. And I can feel it in my blood and I can feel it that Celtic will come together and Celtic will come good as we go forward in this in this season, Paul. God bless Celtic and God bless Neil, Le- Neil Lennon. Do you think there's anything more we can say, Paul, is there? Well, I, Eddie Campbell... Um, hallelujah brother so I think we'll leave it at that yeah. well done Eddie well done Jim hallelujah thanks for joining us Colin and thanks to everybody who's tuned in today join us again tomorrow at 12.30 for a Celtic State of Mind